Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jim. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here, a great honor to be here with the Heartland Institute. The Heartland Institute is an absolutely indispensable beacon of sanity on this issue. Uh, and I'm, I'm also honored to be here with uh, some of the uh, eminent scientists uh, with whom I'm sharing the pages uh, of our book, Climate Change, The Facts, uh, Bob Carter and Pat Michaels and Willie Soon and Scott Armstrong and Alan Moran and Anthony Watts, whom you've uh, just heard from. We're all, in, we're all in this book, so you don't need to wait for us all to write 25 different books. You can get the compressed version. <laughs> All in climate change, the facts. Un unlike, unlike those guys, I've made no useful scientific contribution. Um, <laughs> I've basically only been invited here because, uh, as Jim mentioned, I'm, I'm being sued by the uh, inventor of the global warming hockey stick, Michael Mann. Um, I wish that were a more exclusive club, actually. Uh, <laughs> But in this very room, I've met a, a, a couple of other folks he's threatened. And, of course, my fellow Canadian Tim Ball is here, uh, whom Dr. Mann is suing in British Columbia. Uh, I'm, I'm Canadian, and Tim Ball is Canadian. Mann seems to be a bit Canuckophobic. <laughs> Which is, in this, in this very identity group conscious age, is apparently the only phobia you're still allowed to have in America. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know what's up with uh, Dr. Mann on this. It's payback for the War of 1812 or something. I don't know. Um, but, but anyway, I'm here because Mann's uh, suing me, which, which uh, as I say, isn't really a useful contribution to science on my part. Although if I win and he loses, I like to think that will be a very lasting contribution to science on my part. Not... Uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I understand my limitations. It's a useful contribution. It's not up there with Sir Isaac Newton, uh, but maybe, you know, Ernest Rutherford. It's that kind of, that's kind of, that kind of level. Anyway, the trial's going to be right here in, uh, in the uh, District of Columbia Superior Court, and my lawyer, Michael Songer, is uh, actually here today. Uh, Last, uh, last year, in a trade secrets case, um, he won a big payout for DuPont, of $919.9 .9 million. Uh, and he's promised me we can take Dr. Mann for at least a round billion by the time we're through with it. Um, now, as most of you probably know, um, lawyers don't like it when, when clients talk about the case in public. Uh, because, it, because it can cause problems with, uh, with the judge. Uh, you, you've, you've heard that, right? Uh, I'd never heard it till this morning, uh, uh, till he mentioned it to me just before breakfast, and I'd already written my speech by that point, uh, and I'm hopeless at ad-libbing, so it's too late to change it. Um, so I'll quickly, I'll quickly tell you where I stand climate-wise. This, this Monday is the 800th anniversary of Magna Carta, which the... Uh, <laughs> I see I, one of Her Majesty's Canadian subjects is uh, applauding eagerly there. Uh, which the, uh, which the, barons, uh, the barons forced King John to agree to in a field uh, at Runnymede on June the 15th, 1215. Uh, when I was a schoolboy, we were taught that the England of 1215 was a degree or so warmer than today. And, and vineyards were sown as far north as the Isle of Ely. If you're wondering, if you're, if you're not British and you're wondering where the Isle of Ely is, it's a stone's throw from where the East Anglia Climatic Research Unit <laughs> stands today, the Climate Gate guys. So I will take global warming seriously when they tear down the Climatic Research Unit uh, and sow a vineyard uh, making an amusing little Chateauneuf du Phil Jones. Um, 
Uh, until, until Michael E. Mann abolished the medieval warm period with a, a wave of his magic hockey stick, it was acknowledged as a hugely beneficial phenomenon that led to the flourishing of the economy, agriculture, industry, science, art, uh, and liberty, as in, as in Magna Carta. Magna Carta Libertatum, the great charter of uh, liberties. Uh, apparently, they don't have Magna Carta here in the District of Columbia. So, no. <laughs> they've, got, they've got the D.C. anti slap law, which uh, so far is nowhere near as good, unfortunately. Um, after the medieval warm period, we had the Little Ice Age, and then the, war uh, the warming we've had since the 19th century. I accept the planet has warmed, and I rejoice that it has warmed, because uh, as with the medieval warm period, it's been hugely beneficial to mankind. Uh, I mentioned that I'm Canadian. The entire political, economic, and cultural development of my country has taken place during this warming period. Uh, Nova Scotia, 1848, the first responsible government in the British Empire. Uh, 1867, the birth of the Dominion of Canada. My entire nation has been the beneficiary of this warming trend. There's a statistic that some of you may be familiar with that says something like 90% of the population of Canada lives within 100 miles of the US border. Uh, you know why that is? Because you go beyond that, it's freezing cold. <laughs> Uh, when you revolutionaries and us loyalists had uh, carved up the continent, we should have done it uh, north-south, down the Mississippi. <laughs> I was talking to, to Prof Professor Van Kooten yesterday, who spoke yesterday, and he said he'd moved from uh, Alberta to British Columbia because it was warmer. That's like moving from Louisiana to Mississippi for the skiing. Uh, <laughs> So 90% of uh, Canadians live within 100 miles of the U.S. border. If we hadn't had uh, the warming of the last uh, century and a half, 99.9% .9 of Canadians would be living within 100 yards of the U.S. border. <laughs> It'd just be like one long condo development strung along the 49th parallel. That would be it. So when I first saw Michael Mann's hockey stick 15 years ago, I reacted much as Jonathan Jones, professor of physics at Oxford University, did. Um, if you've never heard of this Oxford University outfit, it's apparently some uh, wacky fringe uh, Coke-funded denialist front group <laughs> where you can uh, download a diploma for 17 shillings and threepence halfpenny. No one takes it seriously. <laughs> Anyway, Professor Jones says, quote, like many people, I was dragged into this by the hockey stick. I was looking up some minor detail about the medieval warm period and discovered this weird parallel universe of people who apparently didn't believe it had happened. And even more bizarrely, appeared to believe that essentially nothing had happened in the world before the 20th century. <laughs> The hockey stick is an extraordinary claim which requires extraordinary evidence. So I started reading around the subject, and it soon became clear that the first extraordinary thing about the evidence for the hockey stick was how extraordinarily weak it was, and the second extraordinary thing was how desperate its defenders were to hide this fact. I'd always had an interest in pathological science, and it looked... <laughs> And it looked like I might have stumbled across a really good modern example, unquote. I agree, I agree with that. Um, for a generation of people across the Western world, Michael Mann abolished not only the medieval warm period, but the entire concept of natural climate variability. If you talk to uh, some of these young activists who've been force-fed this stuff since kindergarten, Uh, they don't even believe, they don't know what natural climate variability is. So I call the hockey stick fraudulent because it is in every sense, both in its construction and in the uses to which it's been put by the IPCC and Al Gore and every schoolhouse and most governments throughout the Western world. Uh, the hockey stick is what's called, as all of you know, a proxy reconstruction. A proxy reconstruction. And there are only two problems with it, the proxies and the reconstruction. <laughs> Other than that, it's fine. Uh, but uh, but uh, uh, my government, um, 
Well, not, uh, not, not my government. I don't want to make it sound like I was responsible for it. Her, Her Majesty's government in Ottawa uh, used the hockey stick to sell Kyoto to the Canadian people, and so did uh, Her Majesty's government down in New Zealand, and virtually every other advanced nation except the United States in between. So real people paid a real price for this. So I call the hockey stick fraudulent in National Review, and Michael Mann uh, sued me for defamation. He, he venue shopped very well. Uh, he doesn't live or work in the District of Columbia. I don't live or work in the District of Columbia. Uh, but I voluntarily submitted to their jurisdiction uh, because I thought if they were so eager to take the case, they'd be capable of litigating a 270-word blog post in under 270 weeks. <laughs> we are now coming up to the start of the fourth year. Is, uh, is this the section uh, mocking and sneering at the incompetent DC courts that you wanted me to take out? Uh, okay. Now, not every part of this case's delay is the fault of the courts. Mann's lawyer, uh, John Williams, incidentally, John Williams tried to sneak in here without uh, paying yesterday. <laughs> Seri I'm being serious, and he had to be escorted out. Um, you, you know, this is such a racist society. When, when black youths gate crash a pool party in Texas, the cops start cussing them out and uh, they draw their guns and they shove their, these bikini-clad teenagers to the ground. But when Michael Mann's $1,200 an hour white shoe lawyer gate crashes the big climate denier's pool party, he just gets politely asked to leave. You know, I'm like, oh, come on, can't you tase him? <laughs> uh, but I, 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 men I mention it, I mention it because if you were kept awake last night by what sounded like uh, occasional thumps against the wall, uh, that was just Michael Mann's lawyer rappelling down the ventilation shaft uh, to get in place before breakfast. Hi, John. Uh, oh, what was that other thing you mentioned? Don't make cracks about the other guy's lawyer because it... It makes it harder to reach a settlement. Oh. Uh, as I said, not all the delay in this case is the fault of the courts. Uh, the, the aforementioned Mr. Williams, uh, Dr. Mann's counsel, filed a complaint with the Superior Court accusing me of, quote, the professional and personal defamation of a Nobel Prize recipient. <laughs> Unquote. Uh, this, this was a hitherto unknown crime to me. Quote, <laughs> defamation of a Nobel Prize recipient. That's not in Magna Carta, uh, <laughs> but it's apparently a crime in the District of Columbia. Um, until then, I had no idea Michael Mann was a Nobel Prize winner. And as it turns out, neither did the Nobel Institute. Um, Uh, a, 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 couple, a couple of reporters uh, called them up, and the director, the then director of the Nobel Institute, Dr. Geer Lunderstadt, said, quote, Michael Mann has never been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize, unquote. That's what he claims to have won, by the way, the Nobel Peace Prize. But notice the subtle elision of his legal pleadings, quote, defamation of a Nobel Prize recipient. So not just a lousy old Nobel Peace Prize winner, where you're standing in the Hall of Fame between Al Gore and Yasser Arafat, <laughs> but a bona fide Nobel Prize, uh, a, a bona fide Nobel Prize winner, where you're right in the same pantheon as Einstein and the Curies and all the rest of them. A uh, man claims to be a Nobel laureate because in 2007, the IPCC, as an institution, received the Nobel Peace Prize. And Mann was one of thousands upon thousands of people who've been associated with the IPCC since 1990. Uh, a couple of years later, you may recall, uh, the European Union uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize. 
So on man's criteria, the EU has 500 million Nobel laureates. You can't, you can't swing a cat over there without hitting a Nobel laureate. You, uh, you go to one of those nude beaches in the south of France, uh, you know, in August, and uh, it's wall-to-wall -wall naked Nobel laureates from, from San Tropez to Monte Carlo. It's, uh, it's the nearest you'll get to seeing Max Planck and Gustav Hertz and Francis Crick doing The Girl from Ipanema. So every EU citizen is a Nobel laureate. Uh, my father's Irish and my mum's Belgian, so I'm a two-time Nobel laureate. <laughs> Eat your heart out, Sir Frederick Banting, you know. Uh, this, this to me is, is important, is important, because it gets to the heart of the bubble that these people live in. Uh, why would they think twice about uh, adjusting their figures. If a man seriously believes that the pantheon of laureates can be adjusted to include himself, why would he be bothered about adjusting uh, the 1915 temperature record uh, the way Noah did uh, just last week? What's the big deal about that if you seriously believe yourself to be a Nobel laureate, as thousands of these guys do? Uh, and that's why they had no qualms about adjusting the 1915, the temperature record of the last century, as they announced last week. That's, that was, I was absolutely stunned, by the way. That was the, absolutely the most uh, dramatically adjusted figure that I'd seen um, since Caitlyn Jenner a couple of days earlier. Uh, If you, if, if you take Michael Mann out of this equation, uh, a lot of the so-called lukewarmers and the moderates and all the rest of it, some of you may know uh, Dr. Richard Betts and Dr. Tamsin Edwards over in England, and they both said that they don't think the term denier is useful. Who uses the term denier more than anybody else? Uh, Dr. Mann has called just about everyone here deniers. I'm just cruising his Twitter, fair, Twitter feed here. Climate denier Joe Bast. Climate change denier John Coleman. Climate change denier Roy Spencer. Anthony Watts. Climate change denier extremist. <laughs> you win, Anthony. You know, there used to be a thing on, on Broadway. Uh, uh, Jim mentioned uh, that I have a, a liking for Broadway. There used to be a thing off Broadway. There was a fashion for plays a few years ago. I think Sam Shepard wrote one of them, where it'd be like some inbred Appalachian family. And uh, at one point, uh, there'd been a stillborn baby, and they just buried it out in the yard, and no one mentioned it. And uh, even though no one mentioned it, uh, the less they talked about it, the worse they got. It still infected and poisoned everything they did. And that is what they're trying to do now with the hockey stick. If they could redo uh, the third assessment report of the IPCC, they would not put everything on the hockey stick. And they think they can get away with just not mentioning it, just not looking at it, just ignoring it, uh, trying not to catch Michael Mann's eye. The fascinating thing about those climate gate emails, by the way, is not all the, the science stuff where the doubts they expressed were well known, but the fact that, uh, but, the, but, but the actual personal relationships between Mann and these poor schlubs uh, in, in East Anglia, who sound like Michael Mann's battered wives. Uh, they, uh, you know, they, uh, they're trying to avoid another slap uh, from him, but they don't, they, don't want, they don't want actually to finally get out and walk away. And they have to get up and walk away from the hockey stick and be seen to do so for the integrity of science. This, this... This, this conference, this conference is called a fresh start. And that is what climate science needs. I urge you to read Matt Ridley's piece in the Australian magazine Quadrant uh, this month. 
that pinning everything, taking a wild ride on the hockey stick, corrupted the heart of climate science. And to cleanse themselves, they have to actually draw a clear line and admit that the last 15 years were wrong, that it corrupted everything it touched, from the prestigious journal Nature, uh, to peer review, to the governments that embraced it, to the Climatic Research Unit, which trashed its founder's legacy. These guys did it from a building called the Hubert Lamb Building. Hubert Lamb was one of the greatest climatologists of the 20th century, and they trashed his legacy to take a ride on Michael Mann's coattails. And climate science, climate science has to make a fresh start and get beyond this, because they will sound ridiculous. Uh, it, we, we heard earlier that many people have not fallen for this. Uh, and that takes a, a great courage. Most of us are not Galileo. I'm glad, by the way, whoever said uh, uh, that, uh, imagine what Galileo could have done if he'd had the internet, because I think he'd just have been posting cat pictures all day. But <laughs> most of us are not Galileo. Most people want to be like most people. And when you look at the polls then of people who say, no, climate change isn't important. It's number 19 on my list of concerns. And you consider that ABC and CBS and NBC and the BBC and the CBC in Canada and the New York Times and Le Monde and the Times of London and the Sydney Morning Herald and everyone else have shoved this thing down people's throats now for 20 years and they're still refusing to swallow it. That is extremely unusual given the levels of propaganda control. And that is why a fresh start is possible. But it requires climate science to recover its integrity and climb off the hockey stick. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. All right, everybody, we have 10 minutes available for questions, so who's got them? Jeopardy rules. Everything you say must be phrased in the form of a question. Or I start to do the song. Uh, so who's got questions? All right, way back. Is there one closer? I'll get to you, sir. Uh, really, no questions. All right, here we go. Uh, Mark, uh, just to clarify things, uh, man sued you and you countersued man. Are both lawsuits still active? Yes, yes, they are. Um, we're now, we're now. Uh, I, I can tell from uh, from your accent that you're as foreign to this jurisdiction as I am. Most of us foreigners know um, only two things about the American court system: uh, that it takes years of your life and it's incredibly expensive. What I didn't realize was that, it, was that it actually takes decades of your life and it's even more incredibly expensive. Um, this, the the anti-slap law, which allows you to get a suit dismissed quickly, uh, at, at the, that's the point. They, they call it because it's a, called a strategic lawsuit against public participation. Man sues people like me and Tim Ball in that, uh, so that instead of uh, going on the internet or on radio and television and stage and talking about Michael Mann, we're just conferring with lawyers all day long and we have no time and he takes us out of the game for the seven years it takes to come. So they invented this thing called anti-slap law, uh, whereby you're meant to get those kind of cases dismissed quickly because it's a public policy issue. He wants to collapse the Western economy, and I don't. And that's something that, <laughs> and that's something that you, should talk, you should talk about in the newspapers and on television and whatnot, uh, but not in the courts, which uh, frankly aren't competent to, to, uh, to adjudicate that. Uh, so they had this slap law, which you're supposed to use to get the case dismissed quickly. Uh, and uh, the, they're now in, the, the appeals court judges are now deciding whether the slap law, which is brand new here, is appealable uh, because when they wrote it, 
they didn't know whether the law itself could be appealed. So you can't, so it's a test case. You can't know how thrilled I am <laughs> to be part of an American test case. But when I, I served discovery on him a year ago, he, he, he asked for my, he asked my, for my, uh, for my discovery, anything that I'd sent, you know, 23 cheap jokes I'd made about him in the last... <laughs> 15 years, um, and, uh, and uh, then when I asked for discovery back, he asked the court to stay discovery, uh, and, uh, and, and so that's, that's the stage we're at. I've countersued him uh, for $30 million. Uh, dollars. I think we initially did it for $10 million, but that's apparently like uh, Dr. Evil in the Austin Powers films. It doesn't impress anybody, so we, we, uh, we bulked it up to, uh, to $30, $30 million. Um, judging from the sales of his uh, new book, uh, he is going to be on a book tour for the next, uh, next uh, two-thirds of a millennium to cover that if we win. Um, but the... Um, uh, so that's, that's the state. But we will, I think we will be going to trial on this. And it's a free speech case, and it's an important free speech. It's the most important free speech case in half a century. I called his hockey stick fraudulent. I've described it as fraudulent since the year 2001 in the National Post of Canada, in Australia's national newspaper, the Australia the Australian, in the United Kingdom's biggest selling broadsheet, The Telegraph, uh, probably a lot, a lot of other newspapers around the world, all the way to uh, Hawke's Bay Today in New Zealand. <laughs> Anyone here from Hawke's Bay? Take a bow. <laughs> hey, yay, go. Uh, hey, really? <laughs> I think they're faking. They're from the general area of New Zealand. <laughs> Um, but so we would be in the bizarre situation if man won this suit uh, that uh, that you would be able to uh, you you would be able to say things in uh, Canada, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia about Michael Mann's science that you can't say in the United States. And I do not believe that it was the intention of the framers of the First Amendment that Americans should have fewer free speech rights than countries which remained within the British Empire. So it is an important free speech case, the most important for half a century, and if he loses, it will be a, if he loses, it will be a great victory for the First Amendment. If he wins, it will be an absolute catastrophe. His hockey stick will, in effect, have smashed the First Amendment into pieces. Uh, Stan, Goldenberg, Stan Goldenberg from the Hurricane Research Division in Miami, which has nothing to do with my question. Uh, I'm sure other people are thinking the same thing. Would you like to sing a few bars for us? <laughs> no, no, I, I actually, I did that uh, in front of the first judge. Uh, <laughs> Natalia Combs Green, and uh, and she resigned from the case. She uh, <laughs> she said, "I'll take another twenty years of landlord and tenant before I hear <laughs> hear that guy do another eight bars." And then I uh, I, I sang for the second judge, uh, Judge uh, Weisberg, and he added uh, just another seven charges to Michael Mann's complaint just for him. So so it, so it uh, it gets worse. It gets worse. Uh, case Van Kooten here. Uh, I was a contributing author to the IPCC report, buried somewhere. Uh, are you trying to tell me that you're taking my Nobel Prize away from me? <laughs> yes. I am. I don't know what Michael Mann, Michael Mann, when he, 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 he resisted this thing that we all took his Nobel, we tried to take his Nobel Prize away, and he had to amend his complaint. Um, because he said he had this certificate uh, that uh, Rajendra Pauchuri, you remember the railroad engineer who uh, ran the IPCC, he'd, he'd gone to the IPCC branch of Kinko's and he'd run off like uh, 47,000 of these authentic looking Nobel-esque, laureate-like uh, Nobel Prize certificates and, and Michael Mann has his then. Now if you get a real Nobel Prize, um, you get a medal, 
and you go to a big dinner with the King of Sweden. Um, and, uh, and as you may recall, Rajendra Pauchuri uh, got into a little trouble uh, in India. His, uh, his choo-choo jumped the tracks. Uh, and uh, he's had to resign from the IPCC. So Michael Mann, he got no medal, he got no King of Sweden, but he has got um, the only Nobel Prize awarded to him by an accused sex fiend. So... <laughs> That is, that is a very unique and appropriate distinction, I think. Um, and uh, and, and Rajendra Re, 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 Pants Downey, I mean, I'm sorry, Rajendra 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 Pauchuri, uh, his case comes up before the Delhi High Court. I would give anything to be before the High Court in Delhi because he'll be halfway through his 20-year jail term before my case has come to trial at the DC <laughs> Superior Court. All right, so, we have one last question. Yeah. Uh, Roy Eppen from the Great Dominion. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm interested in who's funding the other side because I think that's the real... Uh, horror of this case. So is the University of Pennsylvania actually helping or is it just all the Steyer people? Penn State. No, Penn it's, State. Uh, yeah, it's, Penn, it's Penn State. I don't, believe, I don't believe they are. There is something called the Climate Science Defense Fund uh, and they are apparently funding it. Now, and I will say just one final, one final thing, Dr. Roy, because that is, that is an important point. Uh, amici briefs were filed uh, last fall and all kinds of people filed amici briefs against Mann, including NBC, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune. Not because any of them, like me, they agree with him when it comes to climate alarmism, but they understand that this will be a disaster for free speech in the United States if he wants. Because, uh, and I'm, th I'm thrilled to find myself looking at this case in the same way as the uh, ACLU and the Washington Post and all these people. It's very unusual for me because we, are, we think it's a free speech case. He thinks it's about taking a stand for science. And yet not a single scientist, not a single scientific academy filed an amicus brief on Michael Mann's behalf. And that is the lesson of this. He is... He, he claims that he is taking a stand for science and it turns out that science is not prepared to take a stand for Michael Mann. And that is great news for scientific integrity in the United States and the wider world. Thank you very much. <laughs>